Hey guys, what is going on? My name is Tim P. Welcome to my first ever theme month. This month we are going to be looking at the games of Ubisoft Massive, formerly Massive Entertainment, for no real reason at all. They released four RTS games over the course of their lifespan until they became Ubisoft Massive, and we're going to look at every single one this month, starting with Ground Control 1. But does it hold up after a decade? Let's find out. As with every review I do, we'll start at the most important aspect, the story. For such an old RTS, the story is surprisingly complex. The game begins as a cruiser from the Craven Corporation emerges from hyperspace above the planet Krieg 7b. The cruiser quickly dispatches some smaller vessels belonging to the Order of the New Dawn, a religious group in control of the planet. You take command of Major Sarah Parker, a military commander working for Craven. As you play through the campaign, you discover that Krieg holds many secrets largely centered around strange alien pillars found all over the planet. Other prominent characters include director Enrica Hayes, leader of the Craven Cruiser, the CSS Astrid, and all the forces on Krieg, and Major Thomas, another Craven commander who destroys a hospital filled with injured order troops in an early mission, earning him Parker's ire. The Astrid eventually forces the Order's command cruiser out of orbit, and Parker and Thomas destroy the Order's command base on the planet, capturing the largest artifact, now known as Xenofax, on the entire planet. From here on, the game shifts into a new perspective as you take control of Deacon Jared Stone, a commander in the Order of the New Dawn. You simply are trying to survive against Craven forces in the beginning, but as his campaign progresses, you begin to uncover some strange and disturbing information about the Xenofax from your friend, Paladin Magnus. However, things radically shift when Magnus disappears as a new order ship appears in orbit over Krieg 7b, commanded by Cardinal Aguirre. Now, I'm going to end the summary here because there is a lot more to the story that I don't want to give away, but I will say you have not seen the end of Magnus or Sarah Parker. Now that we've taken a look at the summary of the story, however, let's look at some of the details a bit closer. Parker is quickly seen as a strong woman who has very moral feelings about her battles. She understands that her job is to fight and kill, but she never wants to harm the wounded or kill unnecessarily. She also has a serious rogue streak in her, breaking into a Craven facility to find out about the Xenofax, not to mention some of her actions later in the game. This is the polar opposite of Director Hayes, who will do anything for victory and feels nothing towards those around her, only caring about elevating her own position and personal power. Other than the amoral attack hound Major Thomas, there are no other major Craven Corporation characters. The Order of the New Dawn campaign has about the same number of significant characters as the Craven campaign did. Deacon Stone comes across as someone who is trapped between duty and a feeling that he needs to do what is right, especially as he gets more information about the Xenofax. Magnus is someone who is trying desperately to do what is right and doesn't care about following orders, even to the point of risking his own life to do it. Cardinal Aguirre is the absolute epitome of the religious zealot, someone who will completely, blindly follow what he sees as the path to God. Now that we've covered the story's aspects, let's take a look at the second most important pillar of any game, the gameplay. Ground Control was unique when it came out because it was a much smaller scale RTS than most others. By that I mean there is no resource gathering or base building, simply the command of a group of units you customize at the beginning of the mission. From then on, it is up to you to avoid casualties as often as possible while pushing towards your objective as quickly as possible. In the end, it was a welcome change to the usual formula of building up a base, resources, defenses, upgrades, etc. It came down to your ability to use what limited resources you had to the absolute best of your ability, and was a real test of strategic capabilities. Though they differ greatly in appearance, the Order and Craven units are not very different on a technical level. Craven forces use older technology called pterodynes, which are treaded tanks that use bombs and projectile weapons as their main form of attack. They have a tendency to set up very strong defensive positions using special equipment like turrets or healing stations, or have very heavy frontal assaults using their main firepower. The Order, on the other hand, tends to be a bit more speed-focused. 
They use units called hover dyings, similar to Star Wars' repulsor lift technology, where they float a few feet above the ground. As I already said, they move a bit faster than their Kraven counterparts, but have a bit less armor. They have a tendency to dart around the battlefield and use guerrilla tactics using speed boosts that many of their hoverdines can carry. Let's go over the units for each side quickly. Most of the units have a direct counterpart on the other side, so let's cover them quickly before moving on to the unique ones. Both sides have a basic infantry unit that does little damage to armored units, but are good for getting on cliffs that vehicles can't reach and using harassing fire. There are also four frontline combat vehicles for each side. A scout, whose name is self-explanatory, a slightly stronger unit that can be good for circling an enemy to destroy support units, a main battle tank for head-on engagements, and a heavy tank for absorbing damage and setting up ambushes or establishing defensive lines. In addition to their frontline units of infantry and tanks, each side has two more classes available to them, support units and aerodynes. There are three support units available to each group, an anti-air unit that can only shoot air targets, a heavy artillery unit that lobs projectiles high into the air to do heavy splash damage to ground troops, or a general purpose rocket unit that can fire at air and ground targets, but is not as effective as the other two at their specific jobs. Aerodynes are flying units that fly high above the battlefield and can do damage to a number of units. There is a scout aerodyne that is very fast but lightly armored that is just as good at scouting as the ground equivalent. There is an attack unit that can attack air and ground targets, but does not use guided technology, so it's not as good as other ones. And there is a fighter aerodyne that can only shoot other aerodynes, but is not able to target the ground units. Before we finish units, let's go over each side's unique ones. Craven has a secondary infantry type and fourth aerodyne, while the Order has a secondary infantry and fourth support unit. Craven's infantry are the Jaegers, a small group of infantry with incredibly long-ranged rifles designed for hard-to-detect scouting and harassment. Their aerodynes are heavy bombers, which can do the obvious of dropping very heavy bombs directly on groups of enemy units, though they are very slow and poorly armored. The Order's special infantry are called the Templars, religious fanatics who have plasma rockets in their backpacks that they can lob at heavy armor and devastate it which is especially useful for our ambushes and flanking. The only problem is that they are very physically weak and cannot target their fellow infantry, so they need to be escorted or microed very well. The final special unit for the order is the drone carrier, which is similar to the artillery, except instead of energy balls, they launch small spider drones that crawl after enemy units and explode on contact. They are useful when stealth is preferable to the blatantly obvious crashing of artillery fire, though they have much smaller areas of effect and don't do quite as much damage per hit. Though it does not factor greatly into my recommendation, let's take a look at the graphics of the game. Though they are not amazing by today's standards, back when the game came out they were incredible, and they are still above functional by today's standards. The camera is extremely unrestrictive, allowing you an excellent bird's eye view of the battlefield or the ability to get right into the front lines with your tanks as they attack. In addition, all the units have a very unique look to them, and you can always tell what you're looking at, whether it be special equipment, special weaponry, or enemy units that you're trying to track. The only real problem is the very low resolution textures on the terrain. Beyond basic color swaps and some very low resolution trees, there is almost no distinction to the basic map types. The final topic to cover today is multiplayer. There are three game types. Deathmatch, Score Zone, and Flag Zone, all of which have their own unique maps for each game type. Deathmatch is self-explanatory, while Score Zone is a King of the Hill variant, and Flag Zone is Capture the Flag with tanks. All three have only a few options available at the start, such as Score Limit, Time Limit, and whether or not players can call in replacement troops after they have died in the battle. At the start of the match, players are assigned enough troops to fill two dropships that they can customize. Then they are assigned a landing zone to use for the entire battle. The battles can be very fun, but the fact that players cannot drop in different landing zones means that they can both turtle easily and be spawn killed as soon as their reinforcements drop out of the dropship. If you do manage to get a group of friends together, you will have a great time with free for all or team play. It is important to note that the servers for the game have been down for years, but the multiplayer service Game Ranger allows anyone to host a virtual LAN game for free. As always, the final question of my review is, do I recommend ground control for the PC? 
The answer is a definite yes. For such an old game, the story really does still hold up, and the campaign's length will keep you playing single player for a long time coming. The gameplay is still very easy to get into and hard to master, so you will have great fun getting into the game. The graphics, while not amazing by today's standards, more than work, and you have a great cinematic time flying around the battlefield at the bird's eye view or right with your troops. The multiplayer is incredibly hectic and very fun to enjoy with your friends. Best of all, the game is free. Yes, as of 2004, the game was made free to download and you can find it with a simple Google search. Even better, the multiplayer service Game Ranger allows you to play with your friends over a virtual LAN without having to use CD keys, which are no longer available. And now, here comes the end of the review. As I said, I do recommend Ground Control for the PC. And until next time, in Massive Month, looking at yet another Massive game, my name is Tim Petey, and I'll catch you guys later.